Captain Kirk. Fascinating. <laughs> I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. Thank you, thank you. Love you. Mwah. Most illogical. I saw it. Well, that was different. Yep, rousy, but different. Places, please. And here we go. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, bears, purians, and things to episode 60 of the Muppet Trek podcast. I'm Jarman. And I'm Steve. We're here, to, as always, to compare, contrast, and confer about our two favorite franchises. Jarman, remind the folks what those are. Those are, of course, the Muppets and Star Trek, and we do one-to-one reviews of the Muppet Show and Star Trek, the original series. And this week, we have uh, the Muppet Show with special guest Raquel Welch and the original series episode, And the Children Shall Lead. Yes, they shall. And and who is this wondrous creature, Raquel Welch, Steve? American actor, singer, and model. She turned into an international sex symbol almost overnight when image of her in like a fur bikini were used on the poster for the movie One Million Years B.C., which can actually be, be seen backstage in this episode. Yep. <laughs> uh, this made it like a best-selling poster and just put her on the map like overnight almost. Oh, yeah. Uh, she had a string of successful films through the late 60s and early 70s and even won herself a Golden Globe Award for her role in 1974's The Three Musketeers. She has 72 acting credits to her name on IMDb, with the most recent being about 2017. Hmm, very nice. But what's she up to on The Muppet Show this week? Well, backstage this week, Piggy is just generally unhappy that Raquel Welch is there and getting all the <laughs> attention. And Fozzie went to group therapy to be more assertive because he's afraid to talk to Raquel Welch. That's pretty much the entire backstage plot. Uh, on stage this week, Kermit introduces Raquel, uh, which once again, Miss Piggy comes out and is not thrilled about. Uh, she she appears in this like rocky jungle in a scant outfit and dances with a large spider performer to a song. Baby, it's me. It's got some fun wire work from the from the spider performer. Um, yeah, because, I don't know. A little lackluster in my book. Huh. Gonzo then comes out to perform Jamboree, where he talks about his memories and making his own entertainment, and he's joined by a series of random animals, and it's a cute song. Fozzie hits the stage after Kermit says he isn't coming, but it's too late, uh, and they transition into At the Dance while he's doing his act, <laughs> which Fozzie performs over top of as his jokes and his punchlines are ruined by the dancers. Up next, we get uh, Kermit talking one-on-one -on -one with Marvin Suggs in the Muppaphone. He maintains that the Muppaphone loves him and reveals that he crushes one of them every couple months. They go flat, <laughs> quote unquote. The Muppaphone nervously answers questions as Marvin looms overhead, and it's clearly an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. Following this, we get a trip to the Swedish chef's kitchen, and this may be one of the most iconic Swedish chef sketches uh, with him putting a chickie in a basket, ending with him throwing a chicken through a basketball hoop and triumphantly announcing two points. Yeah, I think you introduced me to him by saying that all the time when we were kids. With the chicken <laughs> in the basket. <laughs> uh, backstage again, real quick. Piggy and Raquel talk about the struggles of being an international sex goddess. Of course, Piggy's talking about herself. <laughs> and this leads into the closing number, uh, uh, I'm a Woman, in which Raquel and Piggy go on stage in matching, like, tuxedo-y kind of outfits. Tails. Sort yeah. of. Yeah, tails. And it's a great closer for the show. Kermit thanks Raquel one last time, lamenting that she hasn't changed her image. Fozzie comes out and gets his chauvinism on one last time. <laughs> and that is what we call the Muppet Show. <laughs> yes. So, Jordan, what did you think of this week's episode with Raquel Welch? So I only knew of Raquel <laughs> Welch as, you know, as a, somewhat of an actress, but I assumed or thought she was more of just a, you know, sex bomb kind of pinup kind of thing. Um, and I think she was really good. She actually surprised me quite a bit compared to some other people on this bit on the show, especially like last week's episode where we had a model who really didn't seem to have any visible talents whatsoever. Uh, Raquel could act. She could sing. She could dance like she was just a she was all around like triple threat. And that's the kind of people that are perfect for the Muppets. And she's felt very comfortable around the Muppets. She was fine, cozy and up to them and making them uncomfortable. And um, I like that she was, you know, doing Shakespeare in the beginning. And she's like, I'm going to change my image, be more erudite. But then she's like, nah, I'll just take it all off. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> but it helps that she's gorgeous as well. But I mean, on top of that, it had a really funny moment. I was like, I love when they mix together Fozzie and the at the dance segment at the same time. They're playing with their own conventions. 
They've um, been doing that a lot this season. Like yeah. Acts taking place over top of one another. I think we had a Swedish chef's kitchen that had a, a veterinarian's hospital kind of fall right. on top of it at one point. And I like that. They're kind of playing with their own model <laughs> a little bit. And I just think it was a very solid episode. Not a huge backstage plot that was going on, but um, we did have Fozzie making his way better with her. And they eventually had a song together, Fozzie and him, where she's all cozying up to him and everything. So he got his confidence. Um, but. Yeah, I think overall, a very solid episode, in my opinion. I think she's one of the better hosts we've had in a while. Um, so we've had kind of a, a little bit of a dry spell. But yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah, I, I agree. She was just malleable enough to like get into it and do a lot of different things. Um, they didn't ignore the fact that she was, you know, like a, a sex symbol at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, But I don't think they overplayed it either. Yeah, like they kept it, you know, tamed down for through the the family, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, they kept it tamed down in that regard. I agree. She connected well with the Muppets. The scene with her and Fozzie was specifically good mm. of her connecting with him and really performing with with him. Yeah. Uh you know, none of those weird, awkward looks off camera that we often get. <laughs> Looking down at like, the Muppeteers. Yeah, where, yeah, where do I look? Yeah, none of that. <laughs> Um, and if anything, I think the low point of the entire show for me was, was the opening thing with the, um, with the spider. Uh, I, w- I guess I was just not, I didn't think it was a low point because I was just so shocked by her genuinely. She was a good dancer, a good singer. And I was, I knew it was a track over, but it was definitely her voice. Um, so I guess I was distracted by the fact that, wow, she's actually really talented. So it didn't seem as a low point to me. But I just felt like maybe there wasn't enough going on. That's for fair. Me and to the point where I was like, oh, so this was an excuse to get her into a scan outfit. Yeah. There's only like luckily, the, the one Muppet on stage, basically. <laughs> right. But luckily, the rest of the episode didn't trend that way. Yeah, absolutely. Because I was afraid it, that was every sketch. Every sketch was going to be all right. How do we get her into a scan outfit? <laughs> but I'm glad it didn't go that direction. That's true. Yeah. Um. But no, overall, very good, good musical numbers. I loved, I loved Jamboree mm-hmm. with Gonzo as sort of a little interlude without the host. Uh, getting to see a talk spot, but have it be with Marvin Suggs was also kind of a nice surprise. That's true. I um, like the Jamboree too, because of the fact that uh, it was just a Gonzo number that was able to go all the way through where he didn't screw it up halfway through or something. You know, he actually got a full number, which is kind of nice. That's true. A lot of his end in some sort of debacle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but so I don't think at the top for me, but certainly mid to high. Yeah, for me, for this season, this is towards the top for me for this season that I could get on board with. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's talk about music this week. Baby, it's me. This was a contemporary hit at the time coming out from Diana Ross in 1977, uh, an album of the same name, baby, it's me, uh, just about a year before this episode was filmed. Diana Ross was having a really hot moment at the time of this episode, uh, as the whiz had just come out a few months before Ah. Jamboree. This is one of two songs that is credited as being written by Frank Oz and Larry Grossman. The other, which we heard just earlier this season, was the rhyming song. Okay, nice. Uh, Confide in Me. This is the nice backstage number with Raquel and Fozzie. Another Diana Ross song uh, from that exact same album, Baby It's Me. Diana Ross did a benefit concert in Central Park in 1983. Nearly 400,000 people showed up. Wow. But it got rained out 25 minutes into the performance. She did a makeup performance the next night, and thank God, only 350,000 people showed up to that <laughs> Jeez, one. Jeez, that's crazy. Right. Uh, I'm a woman, ironically, written by two men, <laughs> Jerry <laughs> Lieber and Mike Stoller, uh, first made popular by singer Peggy Lee in 1962. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and Peggy Lee, I was looking her up, she has a crazy career and released more than 65 albums over 45 years. Jeez. Just nuts. Uh, so, Jarman, what did you think was the best Muppeteering moment this week? I would say there's not, there wasn't a lot of technically impressive stuff with the Muppets this episode. So I kind of, by default, give it to the Jamboree scene because had the most Muppets involved um, and it was well done. Um, but yeah, I guess that was my favorite Muppeteering moment this episode. Kind of underwhelming, I suppose. Uh, even though it was my least favorite number, my favorite Muppeteering moment goes to the giant spider costume. Ah, uh, Yes. Um, because I thought the, the use of the limbs was very good 
and and it was choreographed well and the movement was really good yeah that's true. and then on top of that a performer being able to be in a harness and like literally fly around the stage and then they're moving the other limbs with like strings and stuff yeah it's difficult um so even though it was my least favorite number i think that specific aspect was very impressive that very nice that makes total sense so jordan tell us about this week's episode of star trek that we watched Oh, boy. So we got and the children shall lead. Uh, we have the Enterprise receiving a distress call from this Federation colony on the planet Tridacus, which is fun to say. And Kirk, Spock and Bones beam down to find all the adults on the colony dead with only this Professor Starnes left alive. But he seems completely out of it and he soon dies as well. So Bones investigates and he finds out they were poisoned. And from a video left on Barnes's tricorder, they find out that they have all killed themselves with poison after seemingly acting crazy. And soon all of the children from the colony appear and they seem to be completely unfazed by the deaths of all their parents. And all they want to do is play and be really annoying. So they bring the children back to the Enterprise after they bury all their parents on the planet. And Bones cautions Kirk that he should be careful interrogating the children because they haven't processed the trauma of their parents dying, apparently. And if it hits all at once, he could do permanent damage to them. So they got to be careful with the kids. But once all the children are alone in their quarters, they do this weird chant and they summon this weird spirit being type thing called Gorgon, which we don't find out till later. That's what it's called. This guy in a Liberace costume, basically. So he tells the children to take over the ship and head to the planet Marcus 12, where they can then take over more people and kill their enemies. And then they can raise an army to take over the entire galaxy. And then they'll never be told what to do again. So all the kids are very excited about that. So Tommy, the eldest kid, uses his mind powers to have Sulu and Chekhov take the ship to Marcus 12, but he leaves them thinking that they're still orbiting Triacus, so they can still see the planet in the viewfinder, even though they're way gone. So another kid does the same thing to Scotty and the engineering crew, so they think they're still orbiting the planet. And so Kirk eventually finds out they're no longer orbiting Triacus, and he and Spock head to the bridge. And there, these crazy kids have apparently taken over the whole crew on the bridge, and if any of the crew tries to break out of their trance, the kids place a spell on them where they can have to face their inner beast, as they call it, or their greatest fears. And for some reason, Sulu sees a bunch of swords on the view screen, which scares the crap out of him. And he won't let anyone touch his, his buttons because he's afraid the swords will attack them. And Ahura sees herself in a mirror and sees herself very old and on the verge of death and all alone, which makes her sad and she can't do anything. And Kirk fears that he's lost control of the Enterprise, but Spock is able to break him out of his fear. But even Spock can't resist the kids fully because he's unable to force himself to contact Starfleet. He literally can't move his arm to do it. So Spock and Kirk research on the records for of Triacus, find out what's happening on that planet beforehand. And they find out the old civilization there was killed off by some great evil. And this evil was supposedly just lying in wait to find another vessel to escape the planet. Um, and Spock thinks it's just legends, but Kirk's like there must be something to it. So Spock and Kirk figure out the children are merely possessed by this creature Gorgan that they're able to summon. So they try to break Gorgan's hold over the children by showing the kids old videos of them playing with their parents on Triacus. They're all happy and loving it. And then they quickly cut uh, very dramatically to a video of all their parents dead on the ground. And this makes the kids cry and remember that they had loved their parents and they miss them and they realize that they're dead now. So they turn on Gorgon and they no longer are feeding into his power as followers. So he quickly deteriorates before their eyes and dies. And so now the children can grieve properly and the crew of the Enterprise gets their faculties back and they head out to the nearest star base. And that's and the children shall lead. So, Steve, what do you think of this doozy? <laughs> uh, doozy is right. Uh, things I liked. Super surreal opening with the kids like dancing around the pot, the bodies of their dead parents. Oh, yeah. Super surreal. Um, the summoning a demon or I guess angel was a surprise <laughs> and very like children of the corn ish. Right. Um, great reveal that they're no longer orbiting Triacus and just the throwaway death of two red shirts to do it was yeah. extra. was an extra. Oh, yeah, they beam these guys out into space. And they're just dead. <laughs> but Spock, if we're not orbiting Triacus, I just sent both those men to die. <laughs> like, yes, know? sir. You did. <laughs> um, and Gorgon, I have to say this, Gorgon's manipulation of the children was like so, so Donald Trumpy. <laughs> it was just incredible. Anyone who doesn't join us is our enemy. 
<laughs> we will fa- use our newfound powers to fight our enemies. <laughs> like it just it was a very simple childlike speech to elicit hate. It's yeah. kind of amazing. Oh yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, things I disliked. Uh, anxious Kirk. With, like he, they went into the the cave, and Kirk got really anxious because he could like feel the spirit. I guess that was a really tough sell and didn't really pay off in any way. It was odd. Um. The powers bestowed the children were like really ill defined <laughs> and were mostly mostly visualized by them making stabbing motions to make people do what they want or a lewd gesture or someone pointed out. <laughs> right. Um, so this is this is maybe my biggest bugaboo. So the one thing I always appreciate about Star Trek is that even when something seems unexplained, it's always science. Right. This, they really, they basically left this thing as an evil space ghost. <laughs> Gorgon, like they didn't really try to explain it. They're like, up, oh, I guess it's an evil space ghost. <laughs> uh, and I really didn't appreciate that. Oh my God, that's true. Um, like normally most of the time it's like, oh, it's using a, a transmitter on the planet to beam its, its visage here and blah, blah, blah. We have to go down and take out the, nope, it was just nuts. Like an evil space entity that's been waiting underground. <laughs> I like to assume and fill in the blanks in my mind that there actually is an explanation for it scientifically, but for some reason, yeah, they didn't show it in the episode and that's not good. Um, and then one other thing I found really hard to buy was the video they showed the kids of them with their parents and then like the gravestones and all that snap them out of it, but they weren't snapped out of it when they were literally dancing around the bodies of their parents <laughs> at the beginning. True. It just felt like re- what? So video did it, but them literally doing a cha-cha around their dead father <laughs> cha-cha. didn't bring it out. Oh my God. That's um, true. This, there is nothing that I really hated about this episode. Like there are some episodes I really openly dislike (laughs) this, but this will, we will never talk about this one again (laughs) because it's not bottom three, but it's definitely never going to be top. So we'll never have to recap it ever again. Yeah. It's got like some story beats. It it tells a story, a thing happened and it wasn't terrible. And there was, there was action leading us through. So it wasn't boring. It was just like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a space ghost. All right. Okay. And these kids are doing weird stuff. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. And they trick the space ghost with just a, a voice recording of the children. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. All okay. Right. You can do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a, a more trivia for this than we have discussion to talk about it. Cause it's, it's interesting. The stuff that went behind this episode, especially gorgon the guy who plays him if you notice mm-hmm. steve didn't seem like that great of an actor right um <laughs> kind of stiff. i mean he was a stiff hologram so i guess i wasn't expecting much well this guy uh was a lawyer named melvin belly um this is his first time playing a fictional character in any kind what of movie an or tv unfortunate show fortunate name it might be belly or something like that it's b-e-l-l-y mm. it's like Italian. no i'm gonna say it's belly belly uh, so he's a, he was a very flamboyant attorney at the time, very famous, kind of like um, Johnny Cochran was or that woman who represents all the, the people who are um, the Me Too movement. I forgot her name, but there's oh, yeah. these popular lawyers. And so he represented celebrities like Mae West, Muhammad Ali, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, Errol Flynn, Beverly Adland, whoever that is, Tony Curtis, Lenny Bruce, Zaza Gabor, Chuck Berry. Uh, Nick Nolte, Lana Turner, and the Rolling Stones. But his most infamous person that he defended was Jack Ruby, the man who shot Lee Harvey Oswald. (laughs) Holy crap. So this is the attorney that represented Jack Ruby, who shot Lee Harvey Oswald, who assassinated President JFK. Um, And so Walter Koenig, who plays um, uh, Chekhov, considered this to be the worst episode of the entire series. And while he felt the episode was very poor overall, his biggest complaint was the casting of Melvin Belly as Gorgon, firstly because it severely undermined the main villain, and secondly because he considered it an act of stunt casting, which had robbed professional actors from a prof- potential job. Um, and they hoped it would get ratings because they had this famous attorney in the episode, which is very weird. Um, but he had a great voice. He just wasn't a very he was very stiff, and not a very good actor. I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess I sort of chalk that up to the fact that it was 
like a camera trick. Oh, and he couldn't move much. Yeah. So he couldn't move much because it was a set frame camera trick. But that could also I mean, be true. Yeah. Just a mix of, of two terrible things does not make it a good thing. Right. <laughs> so they're interesting. The guy who plays Tommy Starnes, the oldest kid in the in the group. His name is Craig Huxley, the actor. And mm-hmm. he pre- he looked familiar to me. And I realized from the trivia here, he appeared in another episode, Operation Annihilate, as Kirk's nephew, Peter. So he was already in the okay. episode. But also this guy goes on to do great stuff for Star Trek in the future. Um, he made uh, he developed this thing called a blaster beam uh, when his later light in his adult years. It's an 18 foot long aluminum bar strung with piano wire and it's played with artillery shells. And the instrument is distinctive met- metallic twang is used to represent V'ger in the soundtrack to Star Trek, the motion pictures that boong noise. He made that instrument. <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and he used it for other things. And the, it was also used in the Genesis Project music for the Wrath of Khan soundtrack. So he goes on to do music stuff for Star Trek later on, which is pretty cool. Um, Leonard Nimoy, our good old Spock, explained that when he complained about the script to Fred Freiberger, one of the producers, he says uh, the producer responded to him saying this script is going to be what Miri should have been. And if you guys remember Miri, it was the other episode with all the kids and they had to figure out why it was just kids and why they were. Oh, yeah, and the disease that once they get old enough, they like go crazy. Exactly. The grumps, yeah. the, the grunt grown ups or grumps, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and that pissed off uh, Nimoy because he liked Miri and thought it was a beautiful, well acted story and basically thought Freiberger was calling Miri a piece of trash. And he was like, he was very disrespected by that because he hated this episode. Um, at the 50th anniversary Star Trek convention in Las Vegas in 2016, fans voted this the seventh worst episode of Star Trek ever. So I can, I can see that seventh is about right. You know, not too far now. <laughs> uh, and the title and the children shall lead comes from the Bible. Isaiah eleven six. Uh, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and the little children shall lead them. No, nope, no clue what that means. Uh, James Blish, who uh, famously novelized all of the original series episodes, you can buy them all in book form, but they're always a little bit different than the actual episodes and they have more explanations. In that one, Sulu is terrified by the sight of missiles on the view screen, not swords, which would have made a lot more sense, like missiles yeah. coming towards the ship. Space swords. <laughs> it was so weird. Uh, and on the book also, and was also in the original scripts, the children sing spells to cause havoc among the crew rather than the fist pumping gesture which earned a lot of ridicule from fans. So yeah, that was real dumb. I don't know why they changed that. And there's a little thing you might've noticed is suddenly Kirk is calling him Gorgan. And we're like, how did he find that out? We never learned that. Um, and it's never explained how Kirk knew to refer to refer to the friendly angel as Gorgan. Uh, but based on the early drafts of the script and a bit of sloppy editing, um, the writers alternated between the various names explaining why it appeared and stuck so late in the episode. Basically a deleted scene had revealed that Tommy did tell Kirk the name However, the scene took place in the script after Kirk had used the name anyway. So it was just a huge mess and they cut a bunch out and they're like, oh, fuck it. We'll just leave it in there. They'll figure it out. <laughs> and the last little bit here, uh, Professor Starnes and the other male colonists wore jumpsuits that you might have seen in Devil in the Dark with all the miners. Um, oh, OK. And they were used those uh, jumpsuits apparently many times throughout the series if you keep a keen eye out for them. So. There's a little fun trivia for that episode. <laughs> nice. So what are our Trek connection Muppet connections this week? Uh, well, man, I got a bunch. So first I'm going to start by, by further emphasizing the Craig Huxley thing. Cause I found that and it was just nuts. Oh yeah. So, uh, in 1970, he made the, the blaster beam, which was actually an earlier instrument, but he made it out of aluminum, mm. which changed the sound. And then he, and he made it electric so that it could be fed into like digitized sound systems. Right. And then he patented that in 84. And so because of that, he he is like the sole guy that has access to this thing since 84. That's cool. Um, so yeah, he said he was the sound of V'ger. It became synonymous with sci-fi soundtracks. And he's provided Blaster Beam for almost 100 different movies. Wow. This one thing. In, on the list are, just to give you an idea of how much sci-fi uses this thing, Battlestar Galactica, The Wiz, Poltergeist, Aliens, Michael Jackson's ventures such as Captain EO and Thriller. Wow. And Man in the Mirror, Man in the Mirror, Dead Poets Society, Back to the Future 2 and 3, Nightmare Before Christmas, Austin Powers, and even more recent things like The Orville. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. So, so now here comes the connection. He provided Blaster Beam for Poltergeist, Kirk R. Thatcher, 
was the visual effects coordinator for Poltergeist. He was also the punk on a bus in Star Trek four and yeah. a producer, but he's also directed a bunch of Muppet stuff, including the recent Muppets Haunted Mansion, Muppets Now, and was a writer on Muppets Tonight, Muppet Treasure Island, and Dinosaurs. Very nice. Poltergeist. Bam. <laughs> All right. So now some other stuff. Uh, both Shatner and, and Raquel Welch attended the 2005 Warner Brothers Golden Globe Party, and there are pictures of them together. <laughs> Uh, both Welch and Leonard Nimoy uh, had featured stories in the 1970 TV Guide April edition. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, bo- okay, this is cool. Earlier in their careers, both Welch and Leonard Nimoy were in an instructional video short called Sudden Birth, in which a police officer uses his training to help a woman deliver a baby in a car. Hmm. Also in this cast was young James Kahn. Wow. Uh, Brian uh, Tochi, who played Ray, one of the children, uh, he went on to have a very successful voiceover career and nice. will be a very successful voice performer, including playing the voice of Leonardo in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1, 2, and 3. Hmm. The Jim Henson Creature Shop provided all the main characters for TMNT 1 and 2. And Brian Henson was even the second unit director for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1. That's awesome. So now this is where things get a little bit weird. <laughs> Okay, so I found this online blog called the WCFL, and WCFL stands for Women's Celebrity Fight League. (laughs) Some guy, (laughs) I'm going to assume it's a man, some guy wrote play-by-play fake fights and outcomes for fights, like cat fights between female celebrities. Okay. That never happened. There are dozens of these things. <laughs> and one of the fights that is described is between Raquel Welch and Nichelle Nichols. <laughs> That's so random. I'm telling you, look up Women's Celebrity Fight League. <laughs> you will be blown away and disappointed. <laughs> the, the, the dark partners of the internet. <laughs> uh, other, in, other entries include Jane Mansfield versus Kim Kardashian. <laughs> And Avril Lavigne versus Nichelle Nichols. <laughs> what? I kid you not. This exists. So weird. <laughs> um, and that is all the Trek connections for this week. That was more than enough. <laughs> so check it out, folks. The Women's Celebrity Fight League. And I think he deserves a round of applause because last week, if you listeners remember last show. I'm so sorry. There was I'm no so connections sorry. at all. So I had to make up for it. Yeah, he definitely made up for it in spades. Man. Well, it's easy to do because these were the same episode, basically. I of mean, course. I mean, both of them, the similarities of these episodes, both have a rocky planet, uh, Rock Hell's opening number, and the planet the kids are found oh, on. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Both feature someone posing as something they aren't. Raquel talking about changing her image to that of a scholar, but reverting back to being a sexual icon. And Gorgon changing his image to that of an angel only to be revealed as a mucky monster of some sort. <laughs> That's true. Uh, both have people that want to take control over their lives. Uh, we have the children in the Star Trek episode. They want to be in control and not go to bed and eat their own food. And then we have Fozzie on the Muppet show trying to be more in control of his life, you know, be more, be more assertive. assertive. Yeah. yeah. Both feature reactions you wouldn't expect. Children playing the round the bodies of their dead parents. <laughs> And the audience cheering, hearing that Fozzie wouldn't be coming on stage. <laughs> it was a really sad moment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, two men in very similar flashy outfits forced their control over lesser beings. We have Marvin uh, forcing his control over the, what are they called? The the Muppet spiel or the, uh, the Muppaphone. Muppaphone. And then we have Gorgon wearing almost the same outfit as Marvin <laughs> controlling these children. I like that. It's very true, though. The Muppet spiel. Oh, my God. <laughs> the Muppet spiel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's that? Transporter ah! malfunction. Transporter malfunction. All right, it's the part of the show where we transport one character from one of the episodes to the other and vice versa. What you got for us, Steve? Well, this week, Trek to, Trek to Muppets, I've got replacing the animals dressed silly in jamboree with the children uh, <laughs> who chant and circle around Gonzo creepily while making stabbing motions with their hands. I actually had the same exact one. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I added on that it would be entirely now in a minor key and it'd be really creepy and it'd be Gonzo like trying to escape them. I mean, it's, yeah, it'd be wonderful. That's why it's perfect. 
All right. And then Muppets Trek this week, I've got bringing over Marvin Sugza to replace Gorgon. <laughs> Uh, keeping the children in line with fear and trying to take over the world. And a big mallet. <laughs> a huge mallet. Rawr. I had a uh, Raquel Welch transferring over to become Gorgon uh, because then the crew would really have no hope of resisting her and the Enterprise and the entire galaxy would fall under her thrall because true. she's Dude. beautiful, talented, and gorgeous. Yeah, so that's it. <laughs> And I guess that brings us to the end of episode 60 of the Muppet Trek podcast. That's right. Join us next time for the Muppet Show with special guest James Coco. And original series episode, Is There No Truth in Beauty? So from the lovers, the dreamers, and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Muppet Trek podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. Thank you.